So this is a 19, I would say 1974 or 1975 vintage Sony Digimatic AM FM clock radio. And a good friend of mine, his wife graduated from university and got herself a job uh, with a financial institution. And with her fa first paycheck, she went out and got one of these beasties as her uh, alarm clock, because all of a sudden now, no longer being a student and being an employable person, she needed the ability to wake up. So she got one of these. So she always, re she always remembered that magic moment when she got one of these and she found another one at the thrift store. And uh, it was uh, a good condition clock radio, but the guts didn't work. So she haunted eBay for months until another one showed up that the seller swore was running, but was in a bad case. That's this one. And uh, she recently brought the two of them over. So I've got this one here. And just for the proof of pudding, I'll have another one. So we are well equipped. So the objective is to, to do a brain transplant, is to actually move one set of guts to the other. So what has transpired in the intervening period of time this is the one that has damage. You can see that this knob has been chewed on. So this is the this is the the one that has the good guts but the bad case, which she got cheaply off eBay. In the meantime, plugging it in, the beast no longer runs. So the clock just sits there at 9:10 until I manually turn the leaves over. Um, I'll plug this one in just proof of concept, but it'll sit here and it won't advance. The way you could tell these things were running is if I show you via, there is a wheel mounted on the axle of this um, clock that rotates and has some green and white stripes on it. And on a functional clock, that thing turns and you can actually see it move. It's the moral equivalent of the second hand. Well, of course, this one's dead stationary. So objective number one is to take this apart and take it out of the case and uh, find out why it's not running. Incidentally, there's a curious little piece of tape right there and a small opening in the plastic molding inside that that was covering. There must have been another version of this clock radio is produced that had some other functionality behind that window. And in the North American market, they had to apply tape to cover it up because the opening was there on all, all molded parts. Of course, with time, the glue gave up, the thing popped off, and now we're painfully aware that we're missing a feature that other people enjoyed. Generally, television sets, radios, etc. These knobs pull straight out and in this case it's no exception. They just pull straight off. The knob on the top unscrews. And you can see the insert, the metal insert. These two buttons may not look like they come out, but they do. They look straight up. You can see a blue shaft square. There's a hole right in the middle. The other one is the same way. All one has to do is remember the auto was gray and the manual was white. I don't think it makes a difference. The radio is dirty too. It works, but it doesn't work well. So I'll take three knobs off the other one. Take four screws at the bottom. This has one of the old style serial numbers on the outside. When I say old style, I started making little labels that look like this with a serial number and a, and a and the name of the inspector on the label. They started those with their very first product in 19, very first solid state product in 1955. 
I'm going to get my glasses if I can find them here. It's recursive. You need glasses to find glasses. Very much a product of the 70s. There we are. I found the problem. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> it's scorch mark. Oh, look at that. Yeah, yeah. That's a, that's. Well, it's pretty easy to fix, really. It's two wires. They they both um, had a bit of trouble there. <laughs> um, so, is that not incredible that they uh, they uh, are are so ham ham handed they can't assemble high high amperage wires? Um, it's it's uh, kind of fascinating how there's no real effort to beef it up you know it's extraordinary i've seen that again and again and again the it's products not, it's just the plastic casings that's devolved and uh, just destroyed and uh you know they're quite repairable yep but uh you know how it is the person that got it uh, is terrified right because the smell oh yeah like, oh my god we gotta throw this thing out it stinks you know and, and that's exactly what happened so it was really on the way to the dump and they said, oh, Wayne, do you want to take a look? Because I think this is dead. And there it is, just two bits of plastic. Yep. Anyway, there, I'll do this focus a little bit better. There. This is serial number 59141. The inspection is Morio. M O R A O K A, Morioka, Sony Radio. I think that's a wonderful piece of personalization and a product that was destined to be made in the millions. You should hear some of the noises I'm making here. This stove is real, really noisy. <laughs> I heard that. Yeah. No, I'm keeping it on mute because it's just a total racket. So this turns. Here at the repair cafe, we have to do everything ourselves. There's no auto focus. Auto is on holiday. Yeah. Can you see that thing turning? Of course you can. Look at it. The clock now runs. All I had to do was tweak it. Because the simple fact of the matter is, after 45 years, estimated age, the thing has lost all its lubrication. This is the back of the unit. There's where the wires are, there's where the antenna wires and all that goes. Over here is where the AC comes in. This heavy brown wire is our 120 volts AC. It goes to this small board here, just off to the left of the transformer. It goes through some rectification, goes to the transformer. Part of it goes to the synchronous motor over here, which is now running. We should be flicking the, the dates forward. I'm not to so I have some singer oil. Oh, nice. Work. So I'm going to oil the clock somehow. I'm looking for something to apply it with. Are you disassembling this one or are you going to put it in? Um, this, is, gonna... this is the one that's going to go in the other one. This is the good movement. This right. is the cheaper one. The bad case and the good movement. So what I'm doing is I'm just hanging a drop off the edge of this dental tool. A little drop. And I'm trying to squeeze it into the inside where that thing's turning because there's a couple of magnets or maggots. I'm going to try to get a drop on the other end too. I'm going to try to squeeze it in there. And they put that spiral thing on there just so it looks pretty? No, it's so you can see that thing works. I know, but it's just so interesting. Yeah, you, you can see it from the outside. That's oh, how you that's know that the clock is working. It oh. actually is, it's actually designed to be visible. That way you know you haven't lost power in the middle of the night. Because these, this is 1975. There's no battery backup for these. This motor actually takes a non-trivial amount of power. The power draw on this, you'll never see it, my brightness. Mm. 
the power draw is eight watts. So you wouldn't get through the night with a, uh, uh, a typical nine volt battery. No doubt. And there'd be no point in keeping this running uh, on battery power because that motor is synchronous AC. It's actually an AC motor that's running this this little drive here. Mm. So this was very much a um, a work in progress. Oh, I'm not yeah. Going to, yeah, yeah. Just once it's running, and I've done some cleanup on it on the inside here, and I'm going to clean up the two knobs over here. So what's wrong with the other one that it, that it doesn't work? I don't know what's wrong with it. Uh, I, I haven't got into it, but the other one's in a good case. It hasn't got broken knobs on it. Oh, so you're just going for the aesthetic of the case. That's right. That's exactly right. right. This is just a, and this is to get one complete functional unit. Or, nettoyant a contact électronique, as we would say in Quebec. We're not supposed to advertise everybody's products. We're supposed to say repair cafe on everything. That's right. Story of my life losing bits. So, on that happy note, there are two rheostats down in there at the end of those shafts. There's one here, and there's one over there, and I'm going to spray the snot out of these. I'm going to put a, a short blast into each one, and then I'm going to work the knobs back and forth, and then I'm going to power it up and you'll hear the difference. I'm going to leave that via while I do this. Close your eyes, folks. <laughs> Don't try this at home. <laughs> it's going to spray us in the eyes. <laughs> yeah. I suppose. Come on. I'll start blinking. Yeah. Ow. Okay. I can, I can smell it from here. Yeah, no kidding. It's got that smell of death and destruction all over it. This is miracle cleaner for 45 year old rheostats, potentiometers, carbon brushes. Still going. The smart thing to do is to leave it sit for several minutes to evaporate because we do have AC and stuff that will make sparks. By the way, here's another part that you will never once have to force with. This is the it's just a tuner, and the tuner itself is on the back of this, this metal pad. And this is connected to the dial. And it's amazing how much trouble they go to just to make a dial that works with a light in it. This is a hollow cylinder with the numbers for the tuning printed on the inside, as you can see. And a very complex system of belts which connects this shaft and the tuning knob which sits here and the actual tuner and a spring so that when you reach the end of the knob you can still turn the knob because you'd be a dork not to but the thing won't turn any farther there's a very subtle tension on that spring right there it's really tricky and sony was good at this stuff oh, you bet i think everything they built had one of those in it <laughs> well pretty much a lot of them have direct tuning now they can't be bothered to do this fancy no, stuff no. anymore or, well, now, of course, it's all digital, so it's completely irrelevant. Well, okay, well all that string, right? I mean, all yeah. that chewing to make the string. <laughs> That's right. Jeez. I'm also going to spray the two contacts. I'm going to show these classic mid-70s switches. These two blue switches, they live underneath the previous knobs. And they push down, push off. Same with the other one. So they have a series of contacts inside them, which are in there and in there. <laughs> so I'm, no, it's okay. This stuff evaporates like crazy. But I, I just want to get enough down there because what'll happen? Yeah, this this volatile. Just to explain to the crowd, the volatiles in these. hands will evaporate and they'll take the grease and the dirt with them and they'll end up breezing them but that's so what as long as the electronics work <laughs> i'm dying but the radio is fine right that's right lights are on but nobody's home <laughs> okay. I wasn't doing that before. enough of this let's plug it in see what happens 
So I'll turn the radio on on manual. And these should be smooth now. I've got a station. So there's no crackling. That's the volume. That's tone. There's no crackling there. And I'll tune it manually. The hard part is stations. As you know, we, we are rural. At Surrey Christian School, students are challenged. But the nice thing is now there's no static on either knob and the yeah, knobs yeah. work continuously. And that's the smart part of these things. That little amount of effort cleans up 45 year old radios. And here ends the lesson. Ah, nice. Good. Live demonstration. Alrighty. So, um, I'm going to leave, this thing won't start on its own, so I'm going to leave that running overnight. I think letting the, the, the um, lubricant work its way through the system, I want to see this thing start up spontaneously when I plug it in. Then I'll know that it's okay to put it back in service. Was so it I'm going to let this stay warm and run overnight and here on the bench. I think that's the wise thing to do. Did it have a slow start up before? I wouldn't start at all. Oh, it, it didn't start until I flicked it. Uh -huh. Look, I've taken these apart. Inside there, there's a pair of magnets on the column. Actually, there's about six because it's running off the 60 cycles. So it's extremely accurate once it gets going. But once it's lost that tiny amount of lubrication the original gave it, then there's enough friction to keep it from starting turning. An extremely lightweight system. Once it's running and I've got a little, little bit of uh, lube in there, it should be able to soak the lube in. It's only on that shaft that we have to worry about it. So, so it, really, it really doesn't have an adjustment for the time then? No, there's no adjustment. It's based on the 60 cycles. That's right. what makes these things so extraordinarily accurate. It's like all the kitchen clocks um, in North America all run off hydro 60 cycles. And it's a wonderful thing, really. Yeah, we had a few of those. The the constant problem of grease, right? That's right. Grease or lack of lubrication after a certain length of time. See the big wheels just turning? It just yeah. it just moved forward to drop another leaf. So what happens is every sixty seconds when the thing goes through its its full cycle, it just leaf it just lifts the thing forward one three hundred and sixtieth or one or six degrees, because six times sixty is three sixty. So it has to go through all sixty layers. Kind of neat, actually. Yeah, I like those things. Yeah, and of course, over there, there's 24 leaves, 24 hour clock, because it's got AM, PM on the, on the leaves. Very much a system in transition. This was going from analog, you know, a dial to full digital. So these moving parts uh, clock radios are very uh, uh, transitory. And yeah. as a matter of fact, I believe this is an, uh, an American mechanism. For a long time, uh, the Japanese clock radios had a telecron movement uh, made in the States. And they made this entire thing and it was cheaper to do that than to uh, bother making your own in Japan. So it's entirely possible this is an American clock movement. That was probably around the same time as the metric system came in, right? Or tried to come in. Yeah. We got so far and then we stopped. We, we got cold feet. Yeah, America was stuck in the middle. Yep. I the Americans know. didn't even get as far as we did. No, I noticed they still got feet and inches and everything else and, and ounces and I just, I, I don't know where to stand anymore. That's the uh, clock alarm switch. It's an Omron. Omron has made really high quality Japanese switch gear. They, yeah. they make they make limit switches for uh, a lot of control systems. Well, and, yeah, being being part of the slot industry, I had those switches all over the place. Right. You were part of the slot industry? Well, not intentionally, but just being an early gamer. Oh, well, my goodness. The thing one learns. <laughs> <laughs> I did gaming before it was even cool. <laughs> Jeez, what's... Yeah, it's not even cool now. <laughs> you get my drift? Yeah, yeah. It's a it's the me memory absorption thing. <laughs> but I 
I played games until I felt giddy and almost threw up. Oh dear. Oh well. Yeah. <laughs> the early addiction phase, you know. <laughs> yeah, a... no, no kidding. Did you make your fortune? With who? <laughs> yeah, good point. <laughs> there was no connection. I was isolated. <laughs> There's an interesting part. That's the uh, that's the Japanese uh, Mitsumi. Um, um, tuning capacitor. That was that little gadget there, that little white transparent box with the screws in it, is what allowed Japanese uh, transistor radios to fit in your pocket. The Americans couldn't duplicate that technology. Uh, prior prior to that, every, everything had a very large tuning capacitor, a bunch of metal plates that meshed. You've seen them in old radios. And a company called Mitsumi invented that. It's tiny and it's it's assembled laboriously. It's it's little leaves of, of transparent insulator and little little sheets of mica, and they're on shafts that are all connected with those little tiny nuts and bolts there. And it's it's a tuning capacitor which emulates perfectly the mechanism of the the old the old systems. There's another interesting thing. They just love showing off, don't they? They 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 put all their stuff in clear box, so you go, hey, look at this, bud. Yeah, <laughs> we're yeah, doing it. We're doing it, and you can't do it. <laughs> that's right. No, no word of a lie. That's exactly what they were up to. Notice all of the uh, the tuning coils. The little tiny coils yeah. are soaked in uh, resin. They've got sponge, and then they they pour wax all over them. Uh, it's fast. It's much cheaper than trying to uh, mount the stuff, and then. Uh, certify the edges they just they just throw hot wax on it that, that tuning coil right there has uh, wax and there's a piece of sponge here that's sponge that's impregnated with wax there's another tuning coil custom made right there underneath that wax it's it's, it's their version the 1970s versions of potting components that one escaped it cool <laughs> And and uh, for what reason? Just to stop stop the things moving around? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Once it's done, once you've tuned the, the the circuit, you don't want it to move. You absolutely do not want it to move. Um, the density, just extraordinary. Yeah, can't get your fingers in there. No, you can't. No, no room for anything extra. No. Get it. No, this was just slammed together. I used to be able to date the date of manufacture of the components based on the uh, the numbering system on them. These are Elna caps. These capacitors are a company called Elna. Previous, there's another company called Nippon Chemicon. And I can date a Japanese uh, transistor radio to within three months of its manufacture. Mm -hmm. I've got sheets of it. We all have a sport. You were in the uh, gaming industry. I was looking at this shit. Yours is probably more lucrative. Um, I wasn't even thinking of it lucrative. I just like playing pinball. Oh, pinball. I love pinball. Gottlieb. Gottlieb's Royal Flush, my favorite machine of all time. Yeah, I just I just love the mechanisms and the, and the servos and the relays and the, oh, just all absolutely. the junk they shoved in there. It was amazing. Yeah. They used to do that after school. They were illegal in Montreal, and every corner store with its salt had one or two crammed in the back room. I'd be in there in school uniform playing pinball. Oh, that's excellent. Yeah. This doesn't ring. Like that. You have a switch problem. Do you know any Episcopal swear words? Which ones? Episcopal? Episcopal, E-P-I-S-C-O-P-A-L, Episcopal Church. Well, I, I know what you mean, yeah, so, um, hmm. Yeah. I'll, I'll think on that one. Right, that's all right. <laughs>